I started to rebuild my life again. As I hit my late 20s and early 30s, there were times when I went back to drinking. But for many people, addictions can last an entire lifetime. Welcome to Yana TV. Today, our guest is Cindy Tian. And we are going to speak about emotional resilience, overcoming addiction, and how you can build a life that you truly want. Cindy, thank you for joining us in the studio today. Hello, Yana. I'm so happy to be here finally. Yeah, see you again after a very, very long time. Yes, indeed. And when I look at you, I mean, I see a gorgeous woman, very well dressed, who is radiating with happiness and light and self care. And I know for a fact this is not how your story began. Yeah. So please, so that people get some understanding, share mm. with us a little bit, starting maybe from your childhood. So I'm born and bred in Singapore. Yeah, I'm in my 40s right now. And um, uh, I, I came from a family background where um, when I was really young, we had 20 people living in the same household. So that was a lot to take at that time. But in the short gist, you know, I'm born and bred in Singapore. I've studied here. My very first job, I was, uh, I was a flight attendant with an airline and it's it's been a total of I would say 20 years of working and I think as I get older I started to realize and as I reflect back and I learn more about this topic of emotional resilience I started to realize that hey there are certain reasons as to why I did the things I did so everything is kind of unraveling as I'm reflecting, I'm learning, I'm growing older, I'm teaching, I'm speaking on this subject. Well, and now our audience, of course, goes, okay, so what happened, Cindy? Now we really want to know. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? I, I kind of um, struggled with a lot of addictions um, from the time I was in my teenage years all the way to my adulthood. And I think the addiction started as young as when I was um, 11 years old and I picked up my first cigarette. Mm -hmm. And I remembered uh, hiding a packet of cigarettes in my bag and bringing my bag home. My father found the packet of cigarettes in my bag and he cried after that. He's like, oh no, my little girl of 11 years old it says started smoking. So I think the addiction started at that age. But what a lot of a lot of people don't know is, uh, I'm sure you've heard about this person called um, Dr. Gabriel Mate, right? Yes. Yeah, yes. So a um, phenomenal physician and he's well known in his work about uh, childhood trauma as well as addictions. I think a lot of people don't realize that addiction is a response to suffering. And it's really interesting that even at that age, I did not know I was suffering. And, and I believe very strongly that um, it's because of uh, the fact that when I was really young, when I was, when I was sort of born, um, at that time, both my parents were working and uh, they had their full-time jobs. My, my father used to be a flight attendant as well. So he's traveling around the world a lot. And my mother had a full-time job as a secretary. So they were busy and they were doing the best that they can. And during that time and in Asia, it's very common for people to sort of put their children with nannies mm -hmm. and neighbors. So I was one of those children that unfortunately had to be taken care of by different nannies and different neighbors. And as a result of that, I think I grew to, I, I grew to a point whereby I didn't know who to be attached to. Mm -hmm. And some of these caregivers they were not really very nice to me. I wouldn't even use the word abuse. There, there was none of that. But I think a lot of them didn't give me the love and attention that I needed as an infant when that was the most important time. So... Where the baby actually forms yes. a, the concept of trust towards the world. I mean, yes. they say in the first year of life, this is what the baby is actually experiencing, right? So when the baby is surrounded by love and care, then a human being fundamentally in the core learns that I can trust the world, I can trust people. Absolutely. If the baby is not receiving care, then the opposite. I cannot trust people. I yes. cannot trust the world. Yes, yes. And, and that's spot on, right? So I remember I was um, staying with this neighbor and, and you know, um, we'll just call her Aunt Nina. And Aunt Nina had her own children as well. So I was sort of brought in as a fourth child to be taken care of by her. And I remember that I would used to fight with her kids. You know, we were kids, right? We would fight. And, but I was the only one who got punished. And I remember being punished and I had to kneel in, at the kitchen and just pull my ears and I would cry and cry and say, Aunt Nina, can I now stand up? And she would not let me sort of get up until she was pleased. And I remember every night I would have to soothe myself by singing myself to sleep. So that was my way of, you know, making myself feel a little bit more comforted. 
because you're kind of in this house where people are not necessarily really nice to you. You don't feel loved and you don't feel wanted. So I kind of grew up with this mindset that, hey, you have to fend for yourself. You need to take care of yourself. And there is no place for you to feel emotions because you just have to numb all of that away. The pain. Yeah, numb the pain mm -hmm. away, internalize the pain and just carry on with life. So I think that was really the beginning of me starting to ignore how I feel. And by ignoring how mm. you felt, and mm. there was like a lack of, I guess you felt, lack mm. of love, lack of support from the family, that led you to what you say, addictions. Can we specify just addictions? Like what do we mean? Cigarettes, yeah. uh, so, so alcohol? Cigarettes was a very, you know, it started with me being really young, right? So I struggled with some small little, it all started out of fun, right? So it started with, oh, let's have a cigarette with friends. And then from the cigarette, it became a little bit of alcohol. And then when I joined the airline, I think it kind of became worse because the lifestyle was complicated. Mm -hmm. And um, the it, it was a culture where people were competitive and catty. Yeah, so me already feeling like I'm low in self-esteem, I didn't quite believe in myself, didn't quite love and respect myself. And having to deal with that, I started turning to alcohol. Initially, I thought that it was because of fun. But I then realized that, hey, I have got no pleasure in life other than when I'm drunk. So it started from an innocent beer to one beer to three beers, three beers to a bottle of wine, a bottle of wine to a bottle of whiskey. And at one point, it became so bad that I couldn't sleep unless I, would, I, ha I drank something. Mm. And I kind of knew it went into an addiction and because I was so afraid of telling anyone and I needed to sleep. Gosh, it was of so course. horrible when you can't sleep. And then the alcohol didn't even help me to sleep. So I ended up taking sleeping pills with alcohol. And I think, I think it came to a point whereby my highest dose was I took eight sleeping pills. And I probably drank that with half a bottle of whiskey. Well, I'm glad you're still alive. Yeah. So, I mean, you could have not woken up mm. from this. this um, how many years, like in total, you feel you have been just going through this addiction journey? Mm. So I think this addiction journey, and, and, I, and I think that a lot of us, we are addicted to different different things. It might not be alcohol, it could be other things. I think I struggled with a lot of um, issues on shopping as well. Mm -hmm. I was always turning towards something to escape from my pain. Yeah. So, I, so when it comes to the alcohol addictions and the sleeping pill addiction, I think that probably took me from my teens all the way to my 20s, probably at least seven years. Okay, seven to eight years, and it got really bad when, when the sleeping pills came into the picture and because I felt really sick, and that's when I realized I had to do something about mm -hmm. it. And I just want to clarify here, so when we talk also about addiction, like often it has sort of a very like a negative connotation and people mm. usually think it would be alcohol or drugs or shopping or food maybe mm. or gambling. That people think usually under addiction, mm. but actually, I mean, I have all kind of friends, including a lot of you know therapists, psychotherapists, who talk a lot about what addiction is, mm. and you know, according to them, in the modern world, pretty much any human being is addicted to something. Exactly. Right. So it's a coping mechanism. Mm. So the other form of sort of more socially acceptable addictions would be, for example, work. Mm. Especially in Asia, people work so much. Mm. You know, that's also, I mean, considered from a psychology point of view to be a form of addiction yes. when you just spend all your time on one activity more than you probably should yes. for your well being. It becomes sort of compensation for something else which they don't have in their life. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I think fundamentally, when we look about addiction, it's either when we're trying to run away from pain. Yes. Or we're trying to compensate or overcompensate something. Yes. So we're trying to numb something. Yes. And so fundamentally, just not dealing with whatever it is. I find it's also important to change just the narrative of the description of the mm. word, right? Mm. So it's uh, so that's why your story, I find it so interesting mm. because you found tools to deal with that. Mm. Yeah. So you said in your case, it just became really bad, like with yes. pills and alcohol. And I just assume, I guess, you realize that you were, you know, close to really, really bad state. Yeah, I was down right? in the rut. Exactly. I mean, this is, and this also, like what I often hear from people who sort of have, especially those typical addictions that you can't really save a person mm. unless person reaches the rock bottom. 
Mm. So it has it has to almost become so bad, mm. then something you know something opens up in the mind and in the body, mm. and then the human being realizes, okay, I have to do something about yeah. it. Yeah. So it looks like you know you had this experience. So what did you do? Yeah, so I was turning to the addictions all the time, and um, it came to a point of uh, my life where I felt really sick, and it started with my hair starting to fall out. And that was scary. And I remember that there was one time I was uh, in the hotel at Taipei. And, you know, at those those times when we had to bun our hair because yep. we go for flights, right? And our bun was so huge and we put so much hairspray. And I remember going to the toilet to wash my hair, to lather my hair. And I was lathering, lathering, lathering. I suddenly pulled out one big bunch of hair. And I'm like looking at it like, oh my God, this freaking nightmare. Stress. Yeah, scary. And then yeah. continue lathering, another bunch came out. Yeah, so this happened to me and, you know, I called my mom, I screamed so loudly, my hair is falling out. And she's like, it's just hair. That's, no, it's not just hair. This is my life. So it, it happened a number of times. Um, I became almost half bald, thankfully not fully bald, and I managed to take medication for it to recover again. So that was the first one. So actually the one before that was I struggled with sleeping. So that was kind of like a bodily symptom, right? So the first downfall was the inability to sleep. I realized I had to do something about it because I would go to the doctors and I would fight with the doctors, say, can I get pills? And he would not be able to give me. So that was one. Then after that, my hair started falling out. So that was part two. And then just as I thought that everything is going to be recovered because now I'm taking medication, I'm stopping my drinking quite a little bit already, um, I started feeling pain in my legs. Mm. Yeah, so, and at that time, I was running quite a lot because I used to be obsessed about being skinny. That was another the, addiction the that I think, had. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I went to see a doctor. It, the pain lasted for a couple of months. Eventually, I went for a CT scan and they found out that, uh, and I was in my 20s at that time, that my both my hip joints had totally degenerated to that of a 90-year-old woman. That's horrible. Yeah. I mean, to have hip replacement operation, I assume that's what you had. Yes, yes. Especially at this age. That's yeah. quite traumatic. Yeah, it's crazy traumatic. I think I was 20, 25 or 26 years old at that time. And I remember sitting in the hospital and the doctor telling me that, saying, you know, um, there are four stages to this disease and you're on stage four. And he says, I'd like you to go home and, and renovate your home because you're you very likely to be living assistance. in a assistance. Yeah, and I'm like, what the fuck do I do with my life right now? My life has just started and now it has ended. What do you do when someone tells you you're not going to be able to walk anymore suddenly? And you're 25 particularly. Yeah, yeah it's crazy. How did you manage to pick yourself up from that and build to who you are today? Well, it was, it was a whole journey and I'm, I must say that my recovery and building myself up, it's not like a one-year affair, a two-year affair. It's taken me decades. Because even after I went through my operation, which was life-changing for both legs, I still struggled with a lot of these negative emotions and managing myself. But um, to cut the story short, I think during that, um, when I found out about my leg condition and because I was in so much severe pain, I had to stop work for about a year. And during that year, it was you know the lowest point, not just because I was experiencing pain every day, but it was because I had no money. And I had no savings, no money. So I had to... Um, take money from my family, which is an embarrassment. You know, when you're at that age to get money from your family, it's not easy anymore. So it's almost like life came crumbling down. But that's the time where you really sit down and you reflect. You connect with the spiritual side of you. You start to seek emotional support from people who really care. You start to ask yourself, what the hell happened for me to get from there to here? And then yeah. you start rebuilding your life. Yeah, it, it was slowly from then I started to rebuild my life again. And, um, and even as I, as I hit my late 20s and early 30s, there were times when I went back to drinking. Because, you know, I think addiction is a thing that it's, it's not necessarily for certain people, if they are blessed, I think they can just overcome it very quickly. It's a one time off. But for many people, addictions can last an entire lifetime. We keep going back to it because it's a pattern that we have developed. And you need to slowly but surely learn to break that pattern and to pay attention to yourself and to ask yourself, what is it that makes me go to alcohol? You have to observe yourself. Is it something someone said? Is it because I felt jealous of this person? Very often, we are unaware of it. 
but it's the little triggers that lead us to this unhealthy behavior. So we need to start to observe ourselves very closely. And I found that to be super helpful, even as I slowly recovered. And that's eventually brought you into emotional intelligence. Yeah. How was that journey? Mm -hmm. I remember, I think, when we like, had coffee, you maybe half jokingly, half serious, said that when you were younger, you had no emotional intelligence. Yes. <laughs> so yes. what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's very interesting, right? You know, whenever I do my, my speaking engagements or my training, you know, most people would not call themselves as somebody with low EQ. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Most people think that's really high emotional intelligence and are very good with people. So that's the tendency that we tend to have. But I think um, emotional intelligence, emotional resilience is a lot more than that. And when I say that I'm very low in my EQ, it's, it's not because I'm going around yelling at people. But what it means is that I was not able to recognize how I was feeling. I was not able to understand how I was feeling and I was not able to manage how I was feeling. So it was internal. It's how people perceive us. Yes. So when we look at somebody and we say, okay, this person has like a great emotional intelligence mm. because we feel comfortable with this person. Yes, yes. But they might not feel comfortable with themselves. And oh, then yes. it becomes a huge problem. Yes. And that is spot on, right? Because and even if I reflect on my own life, I, I think that I was pretty good with people generally because I've always been in jobs that required me to work with people, right, in the airline and I was in corporate sales and I came out to do corporate training. I was very good with people outside, but I was horrible with myself. And as a result of that, I used to struggle with a lot of, um, first and foremost, I was very judgmental of other people and myself. I was always struggling with jealousy. Yeah, I was toxic and superficial. And it came to a point of time where like, I really did not like myself. Like I look in the mirror and say, Cindy, you spend your entire life polishing up on the apple on the outside, but the, you're on the inside, you are a rotting apple. Mm. And I realized I didn't want to be that rotting apple anymore. Yeah, and I think that was really one of those moments that I started to ask myself, one day you're 80 years old, you're going to look back and ask yourself, have you seriously... Have you really created the life that you wanted? Have you truly loved yourself? And I didn't think I could answer that question then. Self-love is such a, such a deep topic. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious here, um, how was your journey of self-love? Like mm -hmm. how did you learn actually to love yourself and made peace with your past? I think I never knew that I didn't love myself. Mm. I never knew that because most of us in the natural, we would think that we love ourselves, that we take care of ourselves, we wash our hair, we feed ourselves with good food. But even in my 30s and I start to look back, oh my God, I realized that I was really abusing myself. I didn't care about my health. I was drinking like crazy. I was dieting till, you know, I, I looked pale thin and I was really just ignoring my emotions. So I think recognizing the fact that I didn't even love myself in the first place was a very painful process. It's like it, there was one activity where I did, where it's a little bit like self hypnotism, where you go back to your own childhood and imagine you looking at your three year old self. What would you tell your three year old self? And I remember the first thing I said to this little girl, that little three year old Cindy, was, I'm sorry I mistreated you. And it was really, really painful. So mm. that was one. And um, after that, for me, was really. I'm reconnecting to the spiritual side of me. So I, I came from a Christian family. So thankful, thankfully, I had a lot of spiritual support from my parents and um, friends around me. I think reconnecting to the fact that for me, I see my identity as being a child of God. Mm -hmm. That regardless of whether, you know, you're successful in the world, you're as pretty as the girl you want to be, or, you know, whether you've got money or not, you still sort of stick your claim that you are a child of God and nothing can take that away from you. Yeah. And, and then after the third thing was just learning to love yourself regardless of your faults and all. Because um, a lot of us, we, it, it's very easy to compare ourselves to others, right? And to see how weak you are. And, but I think it, it comes to a point of time whereby, okay, I know that maybe I'm not so good at something as compared to someone else, but can I still learn to love and accept? It's like talking yourself and loving yourself in a way that you would love a little child of your own, even if that child is imperfect. I think having that mindset has been very liberating and powerful for me.
Mm, this is such a deeply, deeply touching words and sharing since the end. You know, when they also talk about self-love, mm. a big part of that is also to learn to love parts of us mm. which are not pretty, yeah. which we don't like that much. When we don't show up in a way how we really want to show up, when we are jealous and angry and resentful and superficial, mm. to love that too. Yes. So it's... Um, how, how did you make peace with those parts? I think um, and do I still have those ugly parts? I still do. I mean, we, we of course, are always everyone a does. Process. We all do. We're all humans. Yes, yes, we are. But I think being aware that I, I, I always feel that the awareness is the beginning of change, right? If you're not even aware that you have those parts, that those are your tendencies, then you can't change them. So for me, is this constant reminder of myself that okay, I know I have those ugly parts, but I'm not leaving those to rot and perpetuate. I'm actually working on those. And to catch myself, okay, Cindy, now you're being judgmental. Pay attention to that thought and to ask yourself, hey, is this the right thought that's going to help bring connection to this situation? Is this the correct thought that's going to settle this problem at this point? So I, I question myself and I catch myself. And I think it's a constant process of being more and more conscious and giving yourself little gentle corrections along the way and you evolve. So it's, to me, I think that's my little process of self-correction, self-love and self-acceptance at the same time. Like, hey, you naughty girl, you're having that judgmental thought about that person again? Stop that. And, and again, I okay, still okay. love you. Yeah, and I still love <laughs> you, little girl. You're a sweetheart. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> emotional intelligence. Mm. Uh, we talked a lot about it today. And sort of as we are coming soon, you know, towards the end of our interview, I also would like to leave our audience with mm. some tangible tips mm. that they can implement in their lives. So mm. when we say emotional intelligence, what would you advise today? What I've noticed um, in the Asia Pacific region, and I mean generally with the younger people, is that we are busy. We've got so many things we're doing in our lives. If we have a free moment, we are scrolling our phones. <laughs> so we are busy all the time. And what happens as a result of that is we are not attuned with how we are feeling. And people are always saying, I don't feel anything. Just because you don't feel it doesn't mean it's not there, right? So I think the first thing is try and identify how you're feeling and people feel our emotions in the different areas of ourselves. Some people feel it in their head. That's when they ruminate and they overanalyze. And as a result of that, usually the sensations become headache, migraines, buzzing in the head. So people feel their emotions there. And then the second place that people feel their emotions is in the heart, where they get chest pains, where they feel actually this sinking feeling in their heart like someone has stabbed them. Yeah, so pay attention to some of those things. And the third place that people feel their emotions is actually in the body, in the gut area. And people like that usually struggle with stomach issues, butterflies in the stomach. Yeah, so pay attention to these areas because, you know, one thing I always remind my audience is that your body whispers before it shouts. Mm. Pay attention to your bodily sensations. And just because you don't feel it doesn't mean it's not there. So the awareness is the first step. That's right. And then once I'm clear, like, what do you feel is the best thing to do about it? Mm. I would say that the best thing to do is to process it. That means allow yourself time to sort of examine it. Okay, now that I've identified, okay, I'm feeling a little bit insecure. Maybe that's an emotion feeling. Then I want to ask myself, okay, why am I feeling insecure? I'm going to backtrack. Is it because earlier I went on social media and I saw that one of my ex-classmates is doing something better than me? You backtrack it. So process it. Ask yourself, why did that happen? Now, and then assess the severity of this emotion. Is it an emotion that is you would consider it to be very severe? Is it something that you can just sort of ignore it? And okay, maybe tomorrow I'm going to feel better. Or is it a chronic emotion? It keeps coming back. And once you recognize that it's a chronic emotion, like I'm constantly feeling insecure. And when it's chronic, what happens is it's going to impact your behaviors, right? And your behaviors will then impact the results. So if I'm insecure, I'm never going to step up and share my voice and speak up. When I don't speak up, it impacts my career. So this small emotion can lead to a very big result. So then we start to ask ourselves, if it's a chronic emotion, then how am I now going to direct my efforts to manage it? Do I then reframe my thoughts? That's the, in changing the inner dialogue. Is there something I need to do to change my thinking about this matter? Or is it a skill that I need to improve so that it can sort of soften my insecurity about this topic? 
so eloquently said. I mm. love it, Cindy. Thank and you so much. The final question for today. Mm. You still have many, many years to go ahead yeah. of you. So let's say you live until 300 years in full health, mm. you know, very vibrant. Mm. And uh, you look at Cindy today here sitting on the sofa. What would you like to say to yourself? Mm. The first thing I would say is, you come to the end of your life one day, whether you're 80 years old, 100 years old, and 300 years old, you ask yourself this question, is this the person whom you want to be? Fast forward to your 300-year-old self, is this the person whom you want to be? Yeah. And the second question I would also ask myself is, rather than just thinking about the person you want to be, also be damn clear about the person that you don't want to be. Be sure about that. And once you're clear about that, you start to be able to redirect your life in the way that you want it to go. Thank you so much for sharing your story and joining us today in the studio. My that Thank was you for uh, very, very deep. And that was Cindy Tian on Yana TV. And Cindy and I would love to hear from you in the comments about your stories. Maybe there's something you would like to share. Have you been struggling with addiction? If you're comfortable talking about it, do you need support with that? Mm -hmm. And we're also going to include some links. So we're going to do some research and include some links so you can check it out, where you can reach out for support. And for us, we just wish this, whatever it is that you are going through right now, you are clear on the person you don't want to be and the person you really want to be. Like those were very, very big ones. And I'm very grateful to the Muse Studio for hosting Yana TV. So we love being here. And the most important last part, please remember, subscribe to the YouTube channel and share this video with a friend. Everything starts with the conversation. And when we talk to our loved ones and people we care about, the conversation just becomes so much deeper. And I'm going to be seeing you next time. I'm going to introduce you in my own way how I see you, okay? Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to Let's, find with the sentence can, yeah, something just... that, exactly, that is not boring. You know, coach, trainer is boring, okay? Yeah, so there yeah. has to be something.